He's really, really good. I love the focus this morning. You know, sometimes, sometimes I feel like the focus can be a little bit too much on us on a Sunday morning. And I love the, love the direction that, that Ryan went with that, that song because, you know, we know this. We've received God's love. And that's a beautiful thing. We, we would never be able to love like we do unless we've received God's love. But I love how we ended that song expressing our love to God. I don't know if you sensed it. I certainly sensed it. When you do that, something switches in you. I mean, I, quite frankly, I get even, even more excited. I mean, it's awesome to receive God's love. But, man, it's, it's awesome to be able to give what you have received. It's better, better to give than to receive. It really does. It, it, it does something different in you. So... So to, to sing praise and to worship our Father and tell him how much we love him brings us to a different place. It, it, keeps, it keeps us from getting stuck on ourselves. And I, and I don't want to be stuck there. It, it's not good to be stuck there, right? You agree with me? Amen. Well, uh, we're uh, continuing our, our series, our Untold Stories series. Basically, these are, these are individuals coming up and sharing sharing their testimonies. This is our... This is our third testimony. If you haven't been here for the last two, you missed out. Sorry. I'm kidding. Yeah, you didn't because you can go on the website. Stefan said, we have a website. Yeah, we have, we have a website. You can go on our website and you can click, uh, click on, I think it's, is it messages or sermons? Yeah, sermons. You can click on sermons and you can go back in our archi- archive and you can listen to those unsto- untold stories. Really encourage you to do that if you have, have missed any of them, because they're all incredibly powerful. We have another one today, uh, L- Lorenzo. My brother Lorenzo is sitting over here in the front. I'm going to invite him up in a minute. In a minute. In a minute. I don't want him to feel like awkward sitting up here while I'm talking and he's standing, you know, sitting behind me. Um, but uh, you know, when, when we think about our, our testimony, our, our testimony is our story about how, how God came in in our mess or the mess that was around us and in rescued us, revealed himself to us. And often we're in a place of desperation or we're hopeless or we're depressed or we're just at our wit's end and we don't know where to go. We don't know who to turn to and we just, we just cry out. Sometimes we don't even know who we're crying out to. How many of you have experienced that? I don't even know who I'm crying out to. God, if you're up there, if you're alive and you care about me, make yourself known. And God responds to that. I mean, these, these testimonies are stories about that. Often, often in a testimony, you spend a lot of time talking about where you've been, like B.C., before Christ. Um, what's really cool about this testimony, Lorenzo and I have had a lot of time to talk about this. We talked last night. We actually talked a little this morning because I had part of the story wrong, and, uh, and he corrected me. What's awesome about this story is a lot of it is after Christ. Because how many of you know the mess just doesn't always go away? It, it tends to linger and stay around, especially when the mess has to do with you because wherever you are, you are, and the mess is. And sometimes it has to do with other people that in your li- are, are in your lives that you can't just say, go away. And um, so what's, what's neat about the story is, is about how God continues to walk with us to purify us and sanctify us. Our testimony doesn't just end at our conversion. How many are thankful for that? I'm really thankful that he continues to walk with us and empower us, and we get, we get, we get better. We, we receive healing, and we become useful tools in a God that wants to use us to spread, to spread his love. So I'm going to invite Lorenzo up here. Please welcome Lorenzo Williams. Um, Lorenzo, you can sit right over there, and Deb, did you get it? Oh, look at Deb. Deb's so faithful, she got a water for Lorenzo. Thank you, Deb. No problem, brother. Um, currently, Lorenzo's teaching at the Leadership Academy, and I don't know when this switched, because I, I knew it as Charlotte, Charlotte Middle School, but I think it's a, it's, it's a high school now, right? Yep. Yeah, it's a high school. And uh, it's called the Leadership Academy for Men, so it's just a, it's just a school for, for boys, and that's, that's probably great. They can probably focus on their academic, because... You beautiful ladies aren't around. <laughs> and uh, he's uh, been teaching for about, about 20, 20 years 25. in uh, English, math, and science, yes. right? 
and uh, he just recently took his bar exam for the second time, and we're going to kind of get into that into that story because God did some pretty incredible things so some, through some pretty traumatic traumatic events that happened in his life. So I'm just gonna um, I'm just gonna ask you um, just to share a little bit about your your upbringing, some in some defining events that kind of led you into a relationship with Christ, and then we'll kind of get into. Um, you know, just how, how the Lord met you and how he continued to walk with you some, through some crazy stuff. I told Lorenzo that he should write a book because it's, <laughs> it's, it's pretty cool about how, how um, you know, the Lord just, just entered into his life to really help him walk through some really tough, crazy situations. So, Lorenzo, just share a little bit about your, your upbringing and some defining events that led you to Christ. First of all, I'd like to give honor to God who served me ahead of my life and his holy trinity. I'd like to also give honor to you, Pastor, and your beautiful first ladies, your last lady. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and I'd like to also um, greet everybody here in your respective places. Um, I was born and raised right here in Rochester, New York, um, pretty much raised uh, by just a, a single parent, my mom. Um, I was a person that went to church all the time. My mother took us to church, I'd say, like four days a week. And on Sunday, it was like three times on Sunday because we had to be there at Sunday school. <laughs> then we had to come back for the four o'clock, seven o'clock. So we, we, we lived in church pretty much. And I was a young person who prayed about a lot of things, almost everything, basketball, baseball, whatever. I, I just prayed about everything. And it seems like everything I prayed about, it happened. And I would come home and tell my mom sometime that, you know, I was afraid because everything I prayed for seemed like it happened. But one thing, that, uh, my mother was always sick all of my life. Uh, she had heart trouble. Ever since I knew her, we would come home from school sometime and she would be laid out on the floor because she refused to take the, um, pip, the pills that would drain the water off her heart because she was a Christian that truly believed that God was going to heal her. And so she was trying to prove, I guess, to herself and all the people in the church that you know, she was a believer and that God was going to heal her. So me, being a young person who was getting all my prayers answered, I decided to um, say, well, gee, I can just pray that God would give my mother a new heart because everybody knew she was sick, the whole community, because all, all the kids in the community hung at my house like it was the Montgomery Neighborhood Center. So I said, if he was to give her a new heart, that would be just like the, the parting of the Red Sea. And I thought that the whole community would get saved and all my family would get saved. And, and, and sad to say, about two, three weeks after that prayer, my mother passed away. And I'm, I'm like Max. I promised myself I wasn't going to come back here and cry. <clears throat> but unlike Max, I bought some Kleenex. <laughs> I didn't do like Max did. Max came up without the Kleenex. <laughs> and then I noticed how um, when my best friend came in, Brian Cromarty, um, I, I kind of cried. So I was hoping that it was over because I didn't know Brian was going to show up here. He is my best friend in the world. But um, anyway, after that prayer, my mother passed away and I fell away from Christ. I mean, I, I, you couldn't talk to me about God. Um, I was a person that went through Madison High School. Um, everybody was smoking weed and doing all these other things. I wasn't doing any of it because I was trying to make sure that I was pleasing to my mom, and I knew that she wouldn't want any of that. But after she passed away, I turned into um, public enemy number one, two, or three, somewhere around there. Um, I started selling drugs. I started, um, I mean, even sh shooting at people and had people shooting at me. Um, I was on a mission. Uh, like a death mission, really, really, because I just didn't care about anybody or anything. And um, I also was a single parent at the age of 17 that had to raise my son as a single parent. And when, and when he was about 10 years old, I came in from one night of, you know, selling drugs and doing all these other things, and I was in the bathroom, and I happened to look in the mirror, and I didn't see the person that my mother had raised. And I fell on my knees and started crying, and I asked God, I said, look, Lord, you know, ever since I was in the third grade, I wanted to be an attorney. I'm 28 years old, and I haven't read not one book from cover to cover. I had read one book from cover to cover. It was called The Greatest by Muhammad Ali. That was the only book that I had read from cover to cover. So I asked God, I said, if you're true, like my mom said, you would never leave me or forsake me. If that's true, then take this young brother out of the hood, pick him up, allow me to go to law school and reach my childhood dream, and I'll serve you and your people for the rest of my life. And nine years after that prayer, I had walked across SUNY Brockport's um, stage. I, I grad, graduated with a dual degree, one in education, 
one in business, graduated cum laude. I was the academic scholar for one of my classes, the, the business on the African American Studies Department, and I was accepted into three law schools, and then graduated from Thomas M. Cooley Law School in Lansing, and came home and passed my bar exam. So that was... <laughs> that was truly the beginning of me building this faith that I had in God because I had lost the faith that I had as a child. That childlike faith is kind of easy because, you know, as a kid, you believe almost anything. And then when you see all these things happening, it's kind of easy to believe it. But then when my mother passed away, that kind of like destroyed the faith. But then when he took me, a person that had, had only read one book all the way through law school in the whole nine yards, then I, that started to build on my faith again and let me know that, you know, God was with me, especially throughout the things that I had to go through during my journey through law school. It, it, would, be, it would be nice if the trouble didn't end there, though. Um, you know, so you're, you're, you're a believer at this point, and uh, your faith was tested. You talk about the faith. I, I remember on the, the card that you gave me to kind of outline your story, that on the top you put untold stories and you put faith builders. You kind of you added, that, add that, added that to the title because when you were sharing some of the things that you went through after you became, became a believer, I thought, man, your faith was tested. Sometimes, sometimes you don't realize you have faith until that faith is, is tested. And Lorenzo's faith was tested. Why don't you share with how, uh, you know, you, you, you pass the bar and um, all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're being stripped of your, of your license. Tell, tell us what happened there. Yes, I passed the bar exam. And at the time when I passed it, I was also planning on reloading, relocating to Baltimore, Maryland. So I was going to practice in D.C. And D.C. is not a state. It's the District of Columbia, so I didn't have to take the bar there. As long as I passed the bar in New York State, I can get waived in. So I, was, I moved to Baltimore. But I, before I moved, I had a childhood friend that I grew up with. He lived right across the street from me. And he begged me to do a disability claim for him. And I kept telling him that you can do it because you don't have to have a high school diploma to do that. But yet, and still, he, he couldn't do it, and he didn't want to take the chance to do it, so he asked me to do it. So I did it just before I left. I took care of his claim, didn't know whether I won or lost, because right after I took care of the claim, I moved to Baltimore. And I was gone away from here for about seven years, and my son tricked me to come home because he was planning a surprise party for me because I had told him during my years of talking to him that I had never had a party in my life unless it was, unless it was when I was one years old and I couldn't remember. So he tricked me to come back here. He had set up this big old surprise party. Over 300 some, some odd people was here waiting, and I knew nothing about it. And on our way to the surprise party, as soon as I got in the car and we turned the corner from where I lived, the police pulled up on us. And they started asking him all types of questions. And then he was trying to give him the, the, the license, registration, insurance card, and all this. But the police was being very indignant. So I looked down. I'm in the passing side, and I asked the police officers, you know, what are we being stopped for? Because my son is trying to do everything you ask him. He's complying with you, and you're constantly being rude to him, and you won't answer any of his questions. So he asked me, who was I? And I told him, none of his business. I was a person that was there. Trying, I'm riding in the car, and I'm trying to find out how come you're being so negative with this young man. I didn't tell him at the time he was my son. So then he really got mad at me, and then he started coming at me. And I finally told him, well, this is my son. And I want to know why you're being so disrespectful when he's trying to be nice to you and you won't tell him anything. So he asked me for my ID. And I told him, I'm not giving you my ID because I'm not driving. I don't have to give you my ID. So at this time, he goes around to the passenger side and he pulls out his gun and he called other policemen and they surround the car. It's about, I'd say at least eight cop cars came and they surrounded us in and had us where we couldn't move even though we weren't trying to move anyway. So at this time, I rolled up the window and it was nighttime and I put my license on the on his window so he can see the license. He shined the light, he saw who, it, who I was, he went back to his car, and then about, I'd say two, three minutes later, he came back with his guns drawn and said, I gotta get out the car. So at this point, I knew I was under arrest because I've, I've been involved with the law, so I know when he come back with the guns. The first time, the guns <laughs> didn't scare me because I felt like he was just being a jerk. But this time, I knew I was being arrested. So, you know, um, he took me down. I asked him, what am I being arrested for? He said, I can't tell you, it's a sealed indictment. So I'm still thinking he's just lying because he's mad because I kind of gave him a hard time. So now he's got my son in the back, and he's talking to my son. And then when he finally gets me to the police station, the one who took me there, he started 
apologizing, telling me how sorry he was because he spoke to my son, and my son was so articulate, he said, and that um, he was really, he had some good news and some bad news for me. He said, well, the good news is your son had tricked you to come down here, and there's over 300 some odd people waiting for you to have a surprise party today, tonight. That's where you were headed. And the bad news is I can't let you go because we've already started the process now, and we can't turn around, so you have to be, get arrested. I'm still not knowing what he arrested me for, but now I get irate. I'm in there calling him every name I could think of, except the child of God. And, um, <laughs> you know, and, and um, he, he arrests me. And um, so I spent that night in, in jail, and I was really upset because now I knew my son was hurt because he had went through all this, and I didn't know it. I mean, it was going to be a total surprise. And um, so the next morning when I get up to come before the judge, I'm figuring, okay, well, I'm an attorney. Um, I'm going to be let out of my own recognizance. I'm sitting there. I'm, I'm watching him let drug dealers go. DWI go on their own recognizance. Then when it's my turn, he tells me that I can't go. And he said, now he's finally telling me what I'm being arrested for. He said that I'm arrested for impersonating an attorney and that um, I had a $15,000 bail so I couldn't get out. So I had to go back to the jail cell and have my family get the money up together so that I can possibly get out that day, which I did get out that day. But um, then he offered me, now here it is. I, they offered me a plea bargain. And see, I got in trouble as a kid when my mother beat me almost to death <laughs> because she thought I stole something and I didn't steal it and I wouldn't say I stole it. And then after the beating and maybe a week that went by, they found out who really stole the money. And she called me and they talked to me and said, no matter what happens in life, don't you ever say you did something that you didn't do. Even though I beat you real bad, you didn't do it and you didn't say you did it and don't ever say you did something. So this came to my mind when, the, when the, um, the, the lawyers were trying to make me plea bargain and say that I, I, I committed this crime of practicing without a license. They said, we're going to make it just two misdemeanors, and, and, and you can go. And I wouldn't do it. So we went to trial. So they charged me with two felonies. I'm still thinking as an attorney that once they showed my big old Jewish doctor degree, which they had down there that's bigger than that thing there, they had it up there showing that I had a Jewish doctor degree. They showed the congratulations letter where I passed the bar exam. So I'm figuring, well, I'll be out here when the jury gets the case. The jury was, I'm going to be honest with you, it was 11 whites and one black, and a black woman was so old, she was like in her 80s looked like, and I was saying, well, she going to think I could be her grandson, and, and, and all you need is one vote, and you can't get convicted. You know, you, they, they got to have 12. So I'm thinking that I got to be out. Plus, I'm thinking that even the white ones, I'm saying that they're going to see that I'm an attorney. I, you can't just throw a person away like that. They came out within 25 minutes and had a guilty verdict. And first of all, when they came out so fast, I'm saying, well, I know I'm not guilty now because they, they, they didn't have to deliberate about this because they saw everything. It's right in front of their face. And they came out and found me guilty. And, um, and I was sentenced to two to four years in prison. So I had to go before um, they sent me to the probation, parole, whatever. And I went through the whole processing. The pro probation people got mad at me because I wouldn't say that I was sorry. They kept on saying, oh, you're not going to show no remorse. So they were just really gearing up to send me away forever. But what I did, my son, he came and said, Dad, you and I, we're just going to fast and pray. We're not going to tell anybody else. We're just going to fast and pray, and, and we're going to see what God's going to do. Two weeks later, when it was time for my sentencing, I came before the judge, and right off the bat, he started talking to me as if I had a tail, like I was some type of an animal. And I'm, st I'm just sitting there because he's telling me you, don't, you haven't shown no remorse and just going up and down me telling me that you're never going to practice again because we're taking your license forever. And before, but I'm standing there not saying anything, but be I saw the change in him as he was talking. Before he got through, he had switched all the way over and said, I think that you perhaps can get your license back in the future. You're going to be a, Camilla, a pillar for the community. He started giving me all this all these accolades all of a sudden. I'm just sitting there saying, look at God, but I'm still knowing I'm about to get two to four. I'm still about to go to jail for two to four years. And he got to the sentencing part and said, he's not sending me to jail for two to four years. He's going to put me on probation, and he's going to give me some type of fine and have me do community service. So I was like, wow, God is tremendous because my sentence was already two to four years in prison. So now when I, I took that and said, wow, that, that's just unbelievable. But again, that was the way that God was building my faith up because the more he was doing in my life, the more faith that I was having that he would keep doing, you know. So that was something that was a real setback. But then again, God stepped in and showed me that regardless of what it looks like, if you stay focused on me and not the situation, not your problem, that I'll work it out. 
I'm sure that a, a lot of people can rate, relate to this part of your story. What, what is the proper response when you experience injustice? Because, I mean, come on, a lot of us have, have been there. It's like, it, it's like there, there's a, th this thing that's being said of you or you are being accused of something that you did not, did not do. Reminds me of somebody that hung on a cross for us. Um, but, you know, and you, you, get, you get resentful, you get this anger inside. There's like this sense of justice in you and justice isn't being being done, what's what's the proper response to that? What's the Christian response? Well, to see, that? I have two answers for that, so to speak, because when the injustice is against me, I handle it a certain way, but then when the injustice is against other people, That's good. I, I handle it a different way, like the injustice that I see where it comes to, um, in America, how black people are getting killed unarmed, you know, they don't have a weapon, they're getting killed, and nobody's held accountable for it. Then I look at the injustice in the school system, how the, the poor, the people that can't afford a good education are being miseducated, and I think it's intentional because I've been in the district for over 25 years here in Baltimore. So when I see that type of injustice, I can't help but become carnal-minded. I, I can't seem to call on God like I can when it's injustice for me. That makes me start saying things that I know that God probably doesn't like what I'm saying, but I'm still praying and having them work on me in that area because I seem to love people more than I love myself. With myself, when it happens to me, I turn right to the Word of God because it tells me to seek Him first, His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these other things will be added. So when it happens to me, I can focus on God and I can forget about what's going on with me. But it's very difficult for me to forget about a family when I see a man killed on my, on, on, right on Facebook or wherever. I see him murdered and, and I see how sad his family is, and I see that there's nothing that I can really do except be that individual that cries out to God individually. And that's what really makes me mad about a lot of our Christian brothers and sisters because, you know, we, we claim that we love God and we claim that we're supposed to be Christians, but we sit silently and we see a lot of injustices take place, and your silence is an equest to what's going on. That's right. And God hates injustice, so we're supposed to hate what God hates. So I'm wondering, what, what are we waiting for? Yeah. Amen. First, first of all, I, I appreciate your honesty and your, and your sincerity because, you know, we, it's, it's easy to, to respond, you know, to, to our emotions, to give in to our emotions, particularly when it has to deal with somebody else. I think a lot of us can re relate to that. I mean, I can, I can personally deal with, with, with things that are, I'm accused of a lot better than when I know someone else is being falsely accused. I think I think that's the heart of Christ in you. That's the heart of the Lord in you. So there's nothing wrong with nothing wrong with that. And I also appreciate you admitting that you need to be you need to grow in that area because oh, yeah. we all need to grow in that area. But um, um, so talk to me. It, it it sounds like you have an opportunity here. I mean, even even still, after all this has passed, you have an opportunity to 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 learn about what what forgiveness is. Is I mean even even earlier on in the story you were expressing how you were praying that for your mother's healing, and and she didn't get healed she ended up passing away and you went off the rails you know so how how do how do you deal with forgiveness what does that mean to you well one of the biggest stories I have about forgiveness is a story about my father um, my father wasn't really in my life like I thought he should have been in my life I know my father loved me I loved him until a point and then there came a point when I thought I didn't love him, but um, my, my father was, he was, a per, he was a person that I revered, I feared, and, and I respected a lot. And he made a promise to all of his boys, you know, I have five other brothers, and he made a promise to us that the one that graduated from high school, that he was gonna buy them a car, you know, so we all looked forward to that. And um, he kind of frowned on me because he called me the, mother, the mama's boy, because when he took me to New York for a while, I stayed there for a few years, then I came back home to visit my mom, and all the way home, he had kind of chastised me, telling me that I better not start that crying when it's time to go back to New York, because I'm going back to New York with him, regardless of whatever. And sure enough, when it's time to go back home, I started crying, and, and, and then he made as if he didn't say this, and he says, you don't have to cry, you can stay here with your mother, but from that point on, it seemed like he had it in for me. He always called me the mama's boy. I know he loved me, but that's just the way it was. And then what really, what really hurt me was, I was the only brother that did walk across the stage and graduate from high school, and I didn't get the car that was promised, and my other brother, they didn't really walk across that stage, and all of them got a car some kind of way, you know, through his help. 
So that, that really hurt me. It stayed with me for a long time. And then the straw that broke the camel back was when my mother passed away. He didn't show up to the funeral. And that just really made me really just feel like he don't care, so I shouldn't care. And then the story of forgiveness came in was when I was in that jail cell. This, see, this is how good God is. He put me in that jail cell for a reason. I met this little white boy. He started questioning me about, he was, first he was talking about his father. And I wasn't saying nothing. And then he asked me about my father. And I said, look, man, I don't even talk about my father. I haven't mentioned him in years because um, then I went to tell him what happened. And then he asked me, he said, do you say the Lord's Prayer at night? I said, yes, I do. He said, what about that part that said, forgive, forgive those, you know, the part that talks about how he's going to forgive you if you forgive those. You ask God that part of the prayer. He said, do you say that part? I said, yes. He said, well, then you've been co-signing for God not to ever forgive you because wow. you haven't forgiven your father. <laughs> he said, how? He said, so you're putting wow. something on yourself every single night when you go to bed. You're cursing yourself. The young man made me think. When it's time to go to bed, I waited. He went to bed. I cried out to God, and I cried out to my father, told my father how much I forgive them. For, and I know he was trying to be the best father, you know, he could be. But I was a person that played basketball, baseball, football. I sang in the lead. I was a lead singer in the bands. My father never saw me do anything. So that hurt me also. So, but when this young man had me think about it and cry out to God and ask him to forgive me, not only did I forgive him, but it also built in me how I could be the best father I could be because I, I remembered how he had never been to any of my events, and I made up my mind that I was going to go to everything my son ever did. I didn't care if he was playing hopscotch in the streets, and he wanted me to be there. I was going to be there. And one day he was in a talent show, and I was working at Kodak at the time, and I tried to tell my boss that my son is in a talent show today, and I, and I need to go there because I need to support him. And, and my, my boss told me I couldn't do it. And I told him, I said, look here, you would go to a dog show if your dog was in it today. So I don't care what you say. I'm going to my son's talent show, and I punched out and left. And I felt like my job was going to be gone when I get back the next morning. But again, there was God. I still had the job, and I did check out my son's talent show. So that was where I really learned how I had to forgive people, you know, in order for God to keep forgiving me. And I know that I've done many worse things than my dad did. I, my dad wasn't selling no drugs. He wasn't shooting at people, to my knowledge, you know. And, I, and, and if God can forgive me, then yes, I had to forgive my dad. And my son was about 30 years old. I had never mentioned my dad to him, had never told him my dad's name. I, the next day I called him and, I, and we sat and I told him all about my father. And he was like, Dad, you know, I always thought about why you never mentioned your dad to me. I didn't even know what my grandfather's name was. He said, but I never wanted to ask you because if you wasn't going to bring it up, I wasn't going to bring it up. But I told him everything and I told him, you know, that he has the right to know his granddad. He has the right to love his granddad, even if he's never seen him. That is his grandfather. That is my father. I do love my father. And that's where I really got a sense of, you know, you must forgive. Amen. Amen. And, uh, it, yeah, definitely. On the index card, it was pretty, it was pretty self-explanatory until I got to the last one, and it said, Baltimore's rent. Like, what's that about? And I thought that was a good, a good closing story just to show the, good, the goodness of God and how he's walked with you. Share, share with us about Baltimore's rent. Okay, I'm going to share Baltimore's rent, but can I just take you one more story yeah, that I ahead. think need to be shared? Yeah. I came home and picked up one of my brothers that was involved in drugs. I picked him up to take him to Michigan with me while I was, I was in law school so that I can help change his life. On our way back to, to um, Michigan, we were stopped by the police in Ohio, Sandusky, Ohio, whatever they call it. I had never been there before. And anyway, they, they had us on the turnpike. They made us get out the car. The snow was up to my neighbor, and they had us stand out the car while they would call themselves checking the car for drugs. I told them right off the muscle, I had a 357 Magnum in the car, and I had a permit for it. They got the 357, checked it, and saw that I had bullets in it. So they decided they was going to arrest me because they said that I was supposed to take the bullets out at the border of Ohio and then put the bullets back in when I got over to Michigan, which didn't make any sense, but that's the way they wanted to do because they wanted to arrest me. Well, anyway, they arrested me and, and, and impounded my car and left my brother standing on the turnpike. And it's like early in the morning. It's, first of all, they stopped us about 4 o'clock. They had us standing outside while they were inside the car laughing and having a good time, said that we had to wait out until the dogs come out so the dogs could sniff around the car. So after we was out there for about an hour and our feet were freezing, I finally asked them, said, well, well when is the dogs coming? And they started laughing, saying, well, the dogs don't wake up until 9. So they made us stand outside in that cold until 9, 9.30 before those dogs came there. So when they finally took me away and I went before that judge, 
I started trying to explain to him that I'm a law student. I'm, I'm, I'm about to graduate from Cooley. I need to get there because it's a final exams week. And what he did is told me if I was a true law student, I would keep my mouth shut and realize that you don't talk without an attorney because I was being charged with murder in the second degree and I had 11 different aliases from Cleveland and I still haven't been to Cleveland today. But yet and still, that was my charge. So I guess, you know, again, when they was transporting me back to the jail, I called this police officer more names than I called that police officer in Rochester. I mean, I just cursed him so badly as he was taking, I was telling him, I know why Malcolm X can't stand you. I know why Minister Farrakhan can't stand you. I was just going off, the, just going off. But so you this, didn't call him child of God. Oh, no, I didn't call him a child of okay. God. No, I called him Satan and every other thing I can think of. <laughs> you can believe that. But what happened is when he finally got me to the jailhouse, he said, you know what? I'm going to call this judge to see if, whether you were saying was true or not. I said, I don't care if you call him or not because you guys are going to get the biggest lawsuit that you can ever get when I finally get up out of here because I know what I'm saying is true. I still stayed in, in jail all night. The next morning when they took me back before a different judge, who was much nicer than the first judge because he was there to apologize for what they had done to me because they had then called the judge in Detroit, found out that I had my oral arguments before him during my final exams, and now they released me, but the only thing they did to, to, to make me feel good was to tell me I didn't have to pay for the car that had been impounded, and now they were going to let me go free. So that was an experience that I had there that, again, when I was in jail that night, I was singing. And the guys around me was asking me to sing more songs. I wasn't singing gospel songs because I was a Luther Vandross fanatic. So I was singing all kind of, <laughs> I was singing all those type of songs and they kept on asking me to sing, but it kind of reminded me of when Paul, I think it was, and they were in prison, he was singing all night. I sang all night, I didn't go to sleep that night, you know, because I just couldn't, it, it was just pitiful up in there. So um, again, that was an experience uh, where God stepped in. And when I was in there, he, he talked to me and he said, look here, I made a covenant with you and said that you're yeah. gonna go through law school. You're gonna, you're, I'm taking you through law school because that's our covenant together. So I was in there saying, well, this can't be the end right here because the God that I serve said I'm going to law school and I can't complete law school in jail. So that's, that's what made me really not worry. And then the next day when I woke up, they did release me. So now the story about Baltimore. Well, actually, I'm, no, I'm glad you went there because, because through this whole process, you actually lost your, lost your license, right? Because of the... Because of the... No, my law license was lost because in Rochester, when I came here, about the, when, the, when, they, when I um, the disability claim, right. that's what lost my license, my okay. law license. Okay. I hadn't had them yet during this time when I was arrested in Ohio. I hadn't right. had a license. I hadn't graduated yet. I was on my way back. Right. So just in case you're asking, asking oh, okay, so was he practicing law during this time? He was actually a teacher for 20 years. Well, yeah, I was, I, I was years, teaching so. and practicing law for 20 some odd okay. years. I was doing the both of them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So tell us about Baltimore's rent. Baltimore's rent. <laughs> Um, what happened in Baltimore is I had paid a young man X amount of dollars for security deposit and the first month's rent, and the apartment was right across the street from the Ravens football field. It was perfect. I could walk over there and watch the game, and I'm a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, so I kind of like hated the Ravens and wanted to be there close when Pittsburgh was getting on them. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but, um, but this guy, now, as it got close to time for me to move in, I was calling him, and he was always giving me excuses about that key. And then it was about five days before I had to move in, I said, I got to meet this guy because I got to get this key because I got to get out the other apartment. This guy vanished with my money. I mean, just disappeared. But I knew this guy. I know if I see this guy today, I would know him, especially if he talks because he's got this voice that's, you know, you, I, I would never forget it. But anyway, I was um, very upset. And then I was going to a big mega church in Baltimore. And I went and I was a part of the stewardship. So I went to the pastor and told him what happened to me. So what he did was he gave me back all the money that the young man had stolen from me. And at the same time, I was working at a school in, in Baltimore called Randallstown. And I went to that school for the first day. And, and, and all, all the kids seem to love me wherever I go because I tell them my story. And then I am one of the best teachers on the planet. Seriously, I'm not lying oh, he about is. that. He yeah, is. He's got, he's got that you know, T-shirt on under his sweater. You know, the best so the kids always seem to love me. <laughs> and um, so the, one lady was coming down the stairs. She was like, what is your name? And I said, uh, Mr. Williams. He said, you're the man that all the kids have been talking about. These kids have been talking about you all day today. What, did you, what, what is it that you do with these kids? I said, well, I think that they can see the God in me. And I think that's what makes them kind of draw to me. And she said, well, can I pray for you? And I'm not the person to let anybody pray for me. I really don't because I don't know what you're praying into me. But, <laughs> but, um, but since she was an older woman and she was a sister, 
I said, okay, I know that I felt like this woman had some godliness in her. So I allowed her to pray for me, and she held my hands. She prayed for me. And then after that, I went on up about my business. The very next morning when I was coming in, she was coming down the stairs. I was going up the stairs. She said, Mr. Williams, God told me to do something for you. So I said, now, all the time now, even though the pastor had paid me the money from what this guy had taken from me, I still had that Rochester mentality where I had my golf clubs in the back seat. I was looking for this guy every day because my plan, <laughs> I'm just serious, people. That's a Rochester mentality? Yeah, the, the, where I come from, just the Rochester. part of Rochester. Oh, okay. Yeah, the part that I come from, the west side. I don't have golf clubs gonna, in the back yeah. of my, I'm just saying. Yeah, I was going to break his knees and his elbows, <laughs> and then I was coming right back to Rochester because nobody knew me. So I said, okay, they called me New York down there. They didn't know my first name or nothing, so my mindset was I'm going to break him up, and then I'm coming back home. He's not giving you permission to do this, I'm just No, saying. I'm not giving you permission. I'm yeah. just telling you what was okay. in my mind. Yeah. So now this lady, she told me that God told her to give me something. So she gave me an envelope. I didn't look in the envelope, so I walked on up to my classroom. And when I got to my classroom, I opened the envelope. And I started counting all these $100 bills. So I said, oh, so I said, this, oh, she, no, not a $100 bill. It was a, the check. I looked at it, and I said, she must have given me the wrong check. This, this check said $1,000. She must have wrote too many zeros on there. So, so then I looked down in the part where you sign it, and she said, my blessing from, from me and God to you. So I looked at the check and I started crying because I, it made me have a flashback to where when I sit in churches and people would always stand up talking about, well, God sent me a check that I, had, I didn't know it was coming. Somebody gave me my, and every time I hear the story when I'm in church, I'm sitting there saying, yeah, sure, mm -hmm. yeah, it didn't happen to me yet. You know, I'm just being honest, I'm saying, hmm, it didn't happen to me yet, so why is all these people getting all this money, but I ain't never getting none, okay? But now, <laughs> but now here it is, this woman gave me this money and she didn't know me from a can of paint. So I'm up in my room, I'm up in my room crying. She comes up in the room, knocks on the door, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get myself together because I don't want the kids to see me crying, but they, they weren't supposed to be there for another 30 minutes. So I'm wondering who came in. She walked right in. Mr. Williams, what are you doing? I couldn't talk. <laughs> I'm, I was trying to, trying to tell her that nobody had ever gave me anything in my life seriously. I was a person that I am a giver. I've been a giver all of my life, but no one had ever seemed to give to me. And here was a woman who didn't know me, and she gave me $1,000 and said that God told her to do it. And I was trying to tell her that I'm going to pay, pay, pay her back, you know. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> she was telling me, you don't have to pay me back. This is not what God blessed me to do. He didn't bless me to bless you and have you pay me back. She said, this is just what God has put in my heart. Me and my husband talked about it last night, and, and he told me to give it to you. And, and, and believe me, I cried and I cried, and I took those golf clubs out of my car because I took, that, I took that as God saying, you know what? I've given you double your trouble. So now if you still want to go and look for this guy and break up his knees and elbows, you just want to be the devil. You don't want to be the man of God that you told me that you were going to be. So that really made me take those golf clubs out of the, tr out of the um, car and put them away, you know? But that was really what happened. We're all, we're all very happy that you put away the golf clubs, Lorenzo. <laughs> I got a hammer in my truck, just saying. <laughs> you can throw a hammer. You can't throw a golf club. <laughs> uh, so we had, I know what these are. I know what these are, but, but I think this is, this is important. <laughs> um, some, script, some scriptural truths. That ever, <laughs> I ruined them. Oh, no. oh, All right, scriptures, okay. Um, <laughs> oh, Lord. Yeah, just some scriptural truths that have really sustained you. Because when you, when you shared these scriptures with me in the, Bible, in the Bible study, I had already brought up the Romans passage in, in, uh, in Romans. Um, but you tagged on a, a few more. I'm like, that's good, man. That's, that, that's good, good direction, good instruction to give someone. Share, share with those passages. Well, well, these are the scriptures that God gave me when I was a babe in Christ. And now every time I witness to a person, especially the young babe in Christ, these are the scriptures that I give them. I always start off by telling them they need to go and check out Genesis 1 and 26 because I want them to know why God created them, you know, that they were created to have dominion and, and authority, you yeah. know. And then I go right into Romans 12, 1 and 2. I let them know that in order for this thing to really work for you, you have to totally submit your whole self to right. God as just your normal being, not nothing that you're doing special. That's just what you have to do if you really want to walk this walk properly. And then two is you have to let God transform your mind. 
You got to stop thinking the way the world thinks and d- doing the things that the world does and, you know, do things God's way. And uh-huh. then lastly, the one that I really, this is the scripture that I use even when I was studying for the bar exam because they say that if you complete 75% of the stuff for the bar exam, 97% of the people pass. I only finished 50% because they was telling me I had to study 10 hours a day when I had to work full time and I had to sleep. Eight and 10 is already 18. So that was like, you couldn't do anything. So there was a lot of days where I didn't do nowhere near 10 hours of studying, but what I would do is close the law stuff and say, well, my Bible says in Matthew 6 and 33, if I seek God first, his kingdom and his righteousness, all these other things will be added on to you. So therefore, I stopped doing the studying for the bar exam, which remains to see what happens come this month and a half, I'll get the results. But I stopped studying on the faith that if I was to just run after God, continue to seek him, his kingdom and his righteousness, all those other things are going to be added on to me. And passing the bar is one of all those other things. So I'm feeling like even if I didn't study the way they said I was supposed to study, I did what the word of God told me to do, and I'm expecting to be rewarded for it. Man, good stuff. So I always love after these stories are shared because people connect to these stories. You can relate to some of Lorenzo's stories. And, I, and I'm just asking if that, was, if that is any of you. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to come forward. But I want Lorenzo to pray for you because I, I believe what the Lord has, has brought him through, what the Lord brings us through, you know, when we, when we get to the other side, when the Lord has answered our prayer, we're, you know, we're, we're healed of that thing, or God's brought a healthy relationship into our life. I, I think that we have, like, like an anointing, it, it, and, and we, we have the knowledge of that truth that God will come through for you. So, you know, if you're, if you're somebody that's out there that that's, has experienced injustice or are dealing with, with unforgiveness— I want you to just open up your hearts and open up your minds as I have Lorenzo close this out in prayer and uh, just receive that, this, this prayer from him. And I believe um, as you bank on the promises of God, you bank on the truths of those scriptures, um, blessing will come to you and an answer will come to you. So if you could just all bow your heads and uh, I'm going to have Lorenzo close this out in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I humbly and also boldly come before you, giving you thanks, praise, honor, and glory. Lord, I thank you for your plan for salvation. Lord God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and his finished work at Calvary. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit residing in each and every one of us, Lord. Lord God, I ask that today's message touch somebody's heart plants a seed in someone that the Holy Spirit can water. Lord, I ask them not to look at the messenger, but to look at the message. Lord, I pray that my Bethel family would just grow in faith, believe in God, study to show themselves approved, do the work of God, hate what God hates, and stand up for what God would stand up for. Lord God, I pray that if there's anyone in here today that doesn't know you, Lord God, that they would come forward and accept you as their personal Savior. Lord, that was my prayer last night before I went to bed. It was that someone would be saved after hearing what you've done in my life, showing them that you are a true God, a faithful God, a loving God, a God with mercy and grace. So Lord, I ask you just to forgive us all for whatever we've done that is ungodly, and to just continue to bless us. I ask these things in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit, but most of all, I ask this in Jesus' name.